with nearly every success, there is a line of failures and setbacks, sometimes a very long line. Many of those stories get condensed into pithy journeys that minimize the struggle. That's where From the Ashes with Mark Azale comes in. On today's show, you'll hear honest conversations about triumph and disaster that Mark's guests faced and how they overcame the adversity to shine. Now, here's your host, Mark Azale. Welcome to From the Ashes. I'm your host, Mark Azoulay, and I'm sitting here with Adia Vivi. Now, I first met Adia, we first met at the Center for Group Studies, which is a modern psychoanalytic group training program. And we first met because she was bumming cigarettes off of me outside <laughs> outside of the hotel where, it, where it's hosted. So I enjoyed that because cigarettes are really unpopular with therapists, turns out, you know, yeah. being kind of like a net negative for people. Um, and you know, I like going on the hall, I like talking to people, but Adi was my smoke buddy uh, for part of the, the CGS experience. And ever since talking to her over then and getting to know her in the group, seeing her, you know, intelligence, her fierceness, her this ability to step into intense emotionality and really, you know, from my perspective, speak the truth, I was blown away and incredibly impressed. So Adi, welcome to the show. Thank you. That That is so moving. And yes, I did bump cigarettes from you because um in my prior incarnation, when I lived in Israel, everybody would smoke once in a while. It was much more casual. So I was like, oh, a smoker, we can bond. And then like, because I don't smoke anymore, I would get completely dizzy and nauseous. <laughs> and uh, that would like color the next group that I would be a part of. But um, I definitely shared the same thing. I was like, oh my God, this guy is awesome. Doing all these cool things, running a gazillion shows um, in Boulder and everywhere else and really felt like we bonded so well yeah it even was outside great. the groups oh big time you know like one of the things that i do in group uh you know aaron black is my group leader if you're listening uh take notes <laughs> what Mine i do in group <laughs> yeah really with the same leader <laughs> is i i think almost immediately i size up everyone in the room and i create like teams Right. I like identify the villains, I identify the allies, and then I just work to move, like to have my team score points, right? To have good interactions, to share stuff, to, you know, move stuff. And then I try to like intercept and block the other team. And of course, you know, nobody knows about this, right? Like none of the other members know that they're playing this game in my head. Uh, but Adi, you were immediately on my team. When I saw you, I was like, yep, yep, she gets picked. Uh, let's do that. Um, <laughs> I think this is the first time that I'm hearing it explicitly, but I kind of felt it. I kind of knew that you got my back and that you and I have a kind of like a an alliance in the, in the group, even though I didn't know about the system until right now. <laughs> that was uh, unbeknownst to me. That's good because I come into the group and I'm like, oh, my God, I am completely overwhelmed with everybody else's presentation and I have no idea what to expect. So... I think that's how we complete each other. Yes. Like I bring the like, I'm noticing everything. And you're like, let's organize and go step by step. Yeah, so for those of you that are just tuning in, D and I, we work together on organization development. We've done a couple of talks um, or done some videos on Facebook Live. So we've really gotten to know each other over the course of the past I don't know, two or three years, I feel like. Yeah. You know, um, you were definitely one of those touchstones for me during the pandemic. You know, having our meetings helped to kind of orient and, and ground me with like, okay, I'm going to talk to Adi on Friday. That was really, really important. Yeah. But I'm excited to talk to you in this uh, arena because we're going to talk about something that's not organization development, right? We're going to talk more about you and more about your life and you're from the Ashes story. So there's your cue. Can you tell people <laughs> you're from the Ashes story, a time you failed and got back yeah. up stronger? So when we talked about it, I thought that one of the things that I don't know if I'll call it a failure, I will say it's more of a struggle. Um, and there were moments of, of real low in this particular aspect of my life. Um, but the, what I wanted to share is my journey in terms of a part of my identity, which is that I don't want to have kids or the way I refer to it is being child free. There are different ways that people talk about it. And I thought about that, A, because it's really important to me um, for that particular niche of social, I don't know if to call it choice, that's, that's another thing that maybe we can talk about, but that, that the behavior choice, um, 
way of being of not wanting kids. I really, I think visibility is very important. And despite a growing number of adults who choose not to have children for multiple reasons, um, there are a lot of stigmas and a lot of strong opinions of others toward people, and especially cisgender women who don't want to have kids. Um, so that was important to me. And I certainly went through a very meaningful journey um, and learned a lot both about myself and about child freedom as a community of people who don't want to have kids. So I thought that would be an interesting thing for you and I to chat about. We also never talk about it. I mean, we are like, we know each other. We know that if, if I know, if I remember correctly, you are planning to have them someday. Yeah, I do. I want to be a dad at some point. I got to work yeah. on the girlfriend first, but uh, yeah, <laughs> fatherhood's on the docket for sure. Yeah. And so I think we both kind of like very casually know that about each other. And it's not one of the things that I, I, it's a bit of a litmus test that not really, because sometimes people just don't know anything about it and they express surprise or, or misunderstanding. And I'm happy to educate. I mean, not every day. Sometimes I'm up to my neck with, with um, responses to that. And I might be a little bit more prickly, but Typically, I'm very happy to educate about it. And then maybe after the education, that will be the litmus test. Like, how does somebody respond to me explaining a little bit about it? But with you, you're just like, okay, just another thing that Adi does or doesn't do, which is so nice. It's nice when something about you that isn't all of you is treated as just like a fact rather than a question or I, I enjoy that response. Um, a lot of time... When I was younger, when I was a little kid, I would say that I don't want kids. And that is not a memory that I necessarily have. It's a memory that my family have, the elder in my family. So my mom had told me that I would announce it and then like adults would have reactions. And as the, I think the, from the ashes, part of it is that when we want something that most people don't want or, or even more complicated sometimes, we just don't have a want. I don't have a want for kids. Um, in my research and studies and, and things that I touched on, it's, it's a little bit, it's not the same, but it's a little bit to me um, similar to asexuality. Like there is a no want where most people have a want. Um, you get a lot of invalidation, a lot of rejection, ridicule, dismissiveness. Um, I think of it sometimes with the language of microaggression. Like you're, you're erased a little bit. You're, you're being told that part of your identity is either transient or non-existence. Um, and I, I think it, I don't know because I don't remember those incidents, but I'm sure it got in in some way. And there was a, a part of me that felt really rebellious. Kind of like, what, what is going on? Why would people respond to me this way? But the very first time that I realized that something here is really, that this is a big deal. Because to me, it wasn't a big deal. Like, who cares if I have kids or not? Like, that's, that's nobody's business. And I think for whatever reason, I didn't internalize this, this kind of merge between being a woman and being a mother. Um, I didn't internalize and didn't merge with a lot of what, uh, femininity and womanhood is supposed to be and I consider myself very lucky with that because I have a flexible idea of human beings and masculinity and femininity in their social normative way just I, I, I don't jive with that so that led me to do a lot of interesting work as a clinician and, and just meet interesting people but to go back to child freedom um I had to learn that something here is unusual from others. Now, when I did my research, I learned that a lot of other women actually internalize the idea that something is wrong with them, that they're selfish, that they're damaged, that they're not going to be a complete person, that they're going to miss something huge and really important, uh, or that they'll regret it later, or that their elderly um, years would be really barren or scary. And that just didn't, that just wasn't me. I was like, clearly something is wrong with the environment 
because there's nothing wrong with me about it. There's plenty wrong with me about other things. I internalize all kinds of shitty messages. Don't get me wrong. But it wasn't about that. I, I was, um, this part of me felt really, I, I couldn't understand why it's a problem. So when I was 18 or something, I, I, uh, I said uh, I, I was sitting with a bunch of friends and I was interested in some guy. Um, and it, it was Israel. It's a very, uh, you know, traditionally masculine, militarized society. Um, gender roles are pretty rigid. And um, having children is, you know, in different cultures, it's, it's something that, that means something really big. And in Israeli society, it means something really big and in certain ways really fucked up. In my opinion, it has to do with um, who's supposed to have children? Who do we want to prevent having children? What does it mean to be an adult? Um, and that's true for any society. Like not all women and not all children are considered the same. So part of the reason now, after all these years of, of looking at it, part of the reason that I got so much aggression for not wanting children was because I am white in America, even though I have an accent and I'm Israeli, I'm by and large, I'm, I'm consider myself white and other consider me white. And in Israel, I'm an Ashkenaz, educated, cis woman. And these are women that we, as the hegemony in society desires their children. If you're a teenager or you're poor or you're a person of color, or um, you might be a sexual minority, your children are less desirable and you might have a different reaction. Um, so when I was 18, I was sitting there with those group of people and I liked this, this guy. And I mentioned, I think, I don't remember of course why, but I said, I don't wanna have kids. And my best friend was this guy who, you know, I, I was in this like, in retrospect, very toxic relationship with this group of guys because I was not like other girls, um, kind of like getting creds for whatever not being like other girls meant. Um, and that was a confusing thing in of itself. But then he came to me and very angrily said to me, like, don't you like this guy? And I was like, yeah, I like him a lot. I hope he asks me out. Like, I think we have a vibe. And, and this guy says, then why did you say you don't want to have kids? And I was like, I don't know, you know, it just came into the conversation. He's like, well, it's really unfeminine and I don't think he'll ask you out. Oh. And I was, sh I know, right? Granted, that was like- Not through the heart. I know, it was almost 30 years ago, 25, 20, 20 something years ago. Um, and I was like, what, why? And I, I remember that having, it, it clearly had a huge effect on me because I was like, I still remember it as such a shock. And I think other women in my position who didn't want children wouldn't be as surprised. The, the thing that would make sense to them, those social rules, they would, for whatever reason, I just didn't internalize it. It wasn't how I was thinking about myself as a woman. Um, and I was really surprised, really hurt and angry, um, which is important because a lot of in a lot of other areas of my life, when somebody comes at me with criticism or telling me that my perspective is wrong or something about me is wrong, I'm like, oh yeah, they're right. That's true. I should probably change. And I don't have as much access to my anger when I'm being controlled by others or by society. And so there's something precious for me about this particular thing because I had a lot of access to my anger that somebody is trying to tell me um, that I'm not as much of a woman as someone else. Um, and, and it kind of clued me in that there is something very wrong about those concepts of masculinity and femininity in our society. Because if I don't have a child, that means something about what kind of a woman I am or whether I am a 100% woman or less. Than, like, what does that even mean? That is a very problematic message. Um, and I, I was, you know, I, I went through the Israeli military, which, you know, I was 18, I was dumb. I, I didn't know my political views as much as I know them now and kind of was indoctrinated in this world of Zionism and 
how important it is to have Jewish children um, in, a, in Israel. And, and then I moved to the United States. Th that, that world gave me all this all these messages about who I am and who I'm supposed to be to others, which didn't work for me. And then when I moved to the United States, because I'm Israeli and I am Jewish and I speak Hebrew and, you know, it's, Judaism is part of being an, an Israeli Jew in a way that's, that's so internal that you don't really have to process it as much. I moved to the United States and the only job I could get was in Jewish communities, teaching Hebrew, teaching Judaism. And then I got bombed with those messages from, from those communities. And I, I really felt that there was no escape. And, and that I wasn't alone with. I, I kind of like my, my discovery was that right when I came to the United States, like I think a year or two after, the internet exploded. Facebook just started, blogs just started. And so I opened the blog at the time and talked about child freedom in online. And there I found people who affirmed me. Um, that was a really different experience. And that got me thinking a lot as well. I found that what I'm going through has a name, um, that the phenomena of others responding to me has names, and that I'm not alone. And that I also, there are there is a space, although virtual, in which I have room to play with this. I can, I can be a little bit different than in the real world where I had to be such a fighter. So um, that was a really interesting thing. And it ended up with me writing my dissertation on internet communication of child-free women um, and becoming a doctor through this. So it was a real victory eventually. Um, you didn't know that about me? No. <laughs> That's why I'm a doctor, because I'm child-free. <laughs> That's really cool. I did not know that about you. Uh, good thing we're doing this podcast. I, I didn't know that you had, that you were such a vocal voice in this community, you know, and that you were writing that blog, you were finding people online. That's so fascinating. I can't wait to talk about that more in our second segment. Uh, so as we're wrapping this up, for those of you that are listening, uh, as we move to commercial break, check us out on social media, right? Mark M. Asley at everything. Um, if you like what you're hearing, uh, give us a review right now if you love it give us five stars because we deserve it and um <laughs> stay tuned after the commercial break where we're going to talk to Adi more about her adventures on the internet more about her dissertation and more about what it's like to be child free today become our friend on facebook post your thoughts about our shows and network on our timeline visit facebook.com forward slash voice america in Mark's work with high performers and business owners, it is becoming increasingly clear to him that their biggest obstacle to success is themselves. They are the experts in their field, but are dragged down by their anxiety, poor time management, inability to focus, or self-sabotage. His role is to help you overcome these emotional and organizational issues so that you can truly excel in your business and your personal life. One of the most common hurdles that he sees is perfectionism, a crippling anxiety around performance. It's a fear of not being good enough, being publicly embarrassed, or of disappointing others. These fears paralyze brilliant people and bring them to their knees. This course will help you to break free from this mental prison and have more agency in your world. In this online course, we will break down the prison of perfectionism so that you can break out of it. For more information and to sign up, visit mark-azoulay.teachable.com. That's mark, M-A-R-C, dash Azoulay, A-Z-O-U-L-A-Y, dot teachable.com. Where can you listen to some of the world's top life coaches ready to dish out success tips and entrepreneurial guidance? The Voice America Empowerment Channel will do just that. Whether it's personal growth, building a better business, or inspirational life stories, make it a daily habit to tune into our programs. From weight loss and personal branding to law of attraction and increased happiness, you'll find it every day at VoiceAmericaEmpowerment.com. The Voice America Empowerment Channel. It's your world. Motivate. Change. Succeed. Our thoughts and feelings not only affect our own lives, but the lives of everyone around us. 
find new meanings of love, authentic expressions, and better connections with the people in your life. Tune in to Love Light with Dr. Jean Marie Farish. This program will feature guests and discuss ideas that will bring a better life to you. When you find this perspective on love, it will change everything. Listen live every Friday at 12 noon Eastern Time and 9 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Empowerment Channel. It's your world. Motivate. Change. Succeed. VoiceAmericaEmpowerment.com You are listening to From the Ashes with Mark Azoulay. To reach the show today, please call 1-888-346-9141. That's 1-888-346-9141. Or send an email to podcast at mark com. Now back to From the Ashes. Welcome back. I'm your host, Mark Azule, and I'm sitting across from Adia Vivi, where we're talking about her decision from a young age, really, to be child-free. And she was talking about the pressure that she felt in Israel and then when she immigrated. And it was news to me that she wrote her dissertation about that and uh, joined, and maybe in some ways maybe even started or or seeded an online community around this. Uh, Can you talk a little bit about that? What was it like to all of a sudden connect with all these other women that were going through the same thing? Sure. Um, it It was really surprising. It was really surprising because... I knew from a very young age that this isn't what I want. And apparently there's a name for it in the research. It's called an early articulator. So I was an early articulator and I am the minority. Statistically, most women are not early articulators. And it's kind of a protective factor when you know from a young age, because if you don't, then you might develop a relationship with the concept of motherhood that will make it a little bit more complex. I don't know, protect it. Like it will be more complicated for you. Complication is not necessarily negative. It's, it's rich in certain ways. So I certainly met women who, who were like, when am I going to start wanting this? Um, and I started noticing trends like real anger when somebody identified as child-free and then eventually did end up having children um, because there's so much shit about changing your mind. It's so, it's just exhausting to deal with that message that um, it kind of like, if that's your decision, be committed. There wasn't a lot of room back then, at least for people who were like wondering, do I want it or not? They're not part of this. Um, That there is, there are some really common thing for a lot of us of there's some trend towards social justice and seeing, you know, the veil of the system being lifted for these individuals a little bit. Um, and a lot of joy, like a lot, a lot of joy in that community. There's a lot of like, um, I personally don't have pets, but like, this celebration of pets is like better than kids um, and, and a lot of harm done in terms of invalidation. So there was a lot of mutual support in terms of what do I do? And some of it is like, I'm talking about it a little bit in a trivial way, I think, as I'm talking right now. Um, but some of it is really, really hard if you come from a religious family or, or not even if, if say that you are, you are together with somebody and you are the one who's more vocal about it, their family might be very critical of you and, and have a hard time accepting you because of that. Um, a lot of what we call in the, at least then, you know, I did my research a while ago, it was almost a decade ago, um, but back then there was this idea of bait and switch. Like somebody wants to date somebody who is clearly saying I'm child free. And then that person expecting that you change your mind, that you will actually come around. Um, yeah. But like, isn't that their problem? Like that, that sounds like their problem. It doesn't sound like a bait and switch. <laughs> that sounds like I didn't comprehend what the person was telling me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yes, it, it, you're right. But when you are in a loving relationship with someone 
And you came in saying, I was really clear, we're not going to have kids. And then the partner that you chose for yourself is like, so are we already in the change mind place? You do have to break up. It's still a heartbreak. So you're right. I agree. It's their problem. Um, It's also something that like people don't listen to women who want something different or don't want the usual. There is this expectation that you will toe the party line. Um, So I saw a lot of that. I saw in this community a lot of pain from how other people, um, how other people respond. There's actually a name for it. It's called getting bingoed because if if, uh, the listeners are interested in something a little funny, there is a bingo card online called the breeders bingo. And in is breeders is breeders what you call the people that want to have kids? Yeah, I don't want to insult you breeders, but um, it's not really that. It's more like people who are like, parenthood is everything. I don't know. Pregnancy is the most beautiful thing ever. It's just like this, this like how darling it is and how sweet it is when, you know, being a parent is quite the task. It's not that easy. I, I often thought about like, why? Why are people so aggressive toward me? And my conclusion was, it's a complicated question, but from what I saw um, in in that community is people aren't always happy about their parenthood. It's a very fraught endeavor for a lot of people. It brings up how you were parented in many ways, in a way that you didn't appreciate, and then you find yourself in a similar position, or you you, you actually have days when you don't want your kids. And it, it's very guilt-ridden and shame-ridden, not everybody, but it's it's very common for parents. And I believe that part of the anger toward me was an unresolved something-something in the person in front of me about maybe a part of them that didn't want to have kids. We all have different parts. And that part is disavowed and considered evil, selfish, childish, um, and all the other things they say about child-free people. So if you throw that on me, you don't have to reckon with the fact that sometimes you don't want to be a parent. And maybe there is some loss of identity sometimes and there are very tough moments in it. And in a larger scale, I think people are very comfortable when there is only one road. And somebody like me is saying, actually, there's all these choices. I actually think that um, some hostility um, toward transgender and non-binary and gender fluid people can be at least partially coming from that or, or from the LGBTIA community at large. Like I also have parts of myself that don't fit this mold that I'm supposed to, to walk in and seeing somebody liberated and owning that part of their identity or, or owning who they are is very intimidating. It reminds people that they're parts of them that don't have social room and they want to say that's how it's supposed to be. So they don't have to deal with the fact that they're making a choice to quiet or even deaden a part of themselves and they're not alive fully. Um, So I I feel really, really lucky that I had this like self-knowledge. I also in in that community, um, I saw so much pain because there is this like child hating stigma of people who don't want to have children and look some of us don't like being with children it's when you're sitting a bunch of adults and you you're used to adult conversations and children are there um there's a lot of attention placed on them only particular activities can be accomplished i mean some kids are like little adults but it's noisier it's messier It's not only what you want. And if you elected not to have children, it sometimes feels really imposing. That doesn't mean that you hate children. There is also a political aspect to it. Like one of the thing in in the breeder's bingo, if you go online and find the breeder's bingo, is like children are the future. Okay, well, my child isn't the future because I'm not having it. But that doesn't mean that there aren't other children there. And if children are the future, do you really dedicate your life to make sure that the future of children is guaranteed? I, I highly doubt it. That's not an argument. And, and if you look politically on, on like pro-life, whatever that means, um, rhetoric, you see that life and children are not that important. There's something very restrictive here. It's I would love to have 
less children in the Western world and having a communal sense as, as humankind that children are the future. I actually believe that. Those children deserve a world in which they have water, they have food, they have education. They can, whatever talents they have, have a venue where they can explore them. And that's not how it is right now by far. So I, me not having a child is not ending the human race. And also person or, or like the other thing is like, who's going to take care of you when you're old? I don't know. Will I be old? I don't know. Like, what kind of question is that? So I, I saw a lot of, of pain and humor bundled together in that community. Um, I also saw a, a huge difference in different community. Like I think part of the protective factors that I came with was I come from a secular family. Um, uh, my parents are scientists. I come from a secular um, city where, where people by and large, you know, it's a little, it's a little confusing sometimes for Americans to like, what would you mean secular? You're Jewish, you're from Israel. It's a little different in Israel you're allowed to be Jewish and secular. Um, it's, it's harder here. Not that you can't do it here. It's just a little different. Um, and I, my parents um, are divorced. My mom is very independent and has a lot of agency. So, and she's not traditional in her own way. You know, she, she got married, she had kids. Um, but there's something about her that rebels against um norms as well so i think i got this message but if you're from a religious family and especially a religious community if if you have communal life um in america i had some some subjects in my study that were from an army base from like an army family and they were in a base and um if you come from a, a smaller place a rural place those are kind of risk factor you might say for getting so much invalidation that you might be harmed. Invalidation and gaslighting and, and denial of your identity is really painful and harmful. It means that a part of you, and it might be a part that's very joyous and is asking to be celebrated, is being called names, is being rejected, and that creates a lot of pain. And that's true for, for everybody. Um, that's something that I think human beings feel at large. But when the environment, when the society is telling you that there's a part of you that isn't important, um, that, that's really tough. And the other thing that I learned is, and, and that's something I think that we see more and more, and, and I think it's wonderful, is that intersectionality matters. Like I said earlier, I think it would have been very different for me if, if I were a Palestinian, a Muslim Palestinian woman in Israel. I don't think if living in, in the community that I was a part of, I might have other stressors and, and, um, and difficulties within that community, but the Israeli hegemonic society would have rejoiced if I didn't have children. So, so that's something that was really interesting to me. Um, I read, I don't remember off the top of my head um, which and what. If anybody of the, of the listeners is interested, I can, I can find a reference. But in, in the last article that I wrote about this, I, I found this one chapter in a book by this black social worker who didn't have children and how complex that was for her. Um, she, she didn't want to have children, if I remember. I don't want to misrepresent, but... But then she realized that part of it was the, the kind of like having to be a model uh, person as a minority and having to work in a way that's far above and beyond white people. So children kind of didn't make sense. And there was a lot of loss and, and, and a sense of grief. And even if you are choosing not to have children, you might have some grief. Even I, who's like an early articulator and I'm very secure in this, I have moments of grief about it. Um, just like it was something that I will never know. And I actually really, I really like kids. And specifically in my life, the, the kids in my family are in Israel. I don't have family here in the United States. I always wanted to be an active aunt and I can't because my, my uh, nieces and nephews are far away. Yeah, Do we what have else time? Is, What's... Yeah, what else is it like for you now 
because you were saying, you know, you're over kind of the biological wall. Right. I know a lot of women experience and feel. So what's it like for you now living your life? I think part of like the, again, the from the ashes is I was so feisty about it. So angry. Um, I wrote the dissertation as a fuck you to the world. <laughs> um, like, oh, you're going to tell me that this is wrong. I'm going to show you it's right. I was, you know, I, I, I was in my 30s and, and people are so, so engaged with your uterus when you're during your fertility years. And now I'm in my mid 40s and it's just, it's just a very casual, comfortable part of me. It's, it's really something that the people around me, you know, uh, are, everybody knows. I have nobody in my immediate environment who would ever say, are you sure? Ever. I'm the woman who wrote her dissertation about it. So really I'm surrounded with friends and family who if any of them ever thought of saying that to me, they already did. Um, I, it's, I, I like now have the air of an expert on something. And if somebody doesn't know, like I, when I was younger, I was like, people, women said to me, all women want to have children. And they're like, uh, I just told you I don't. So there's at least one woman, you know, that doesn't. And there was a complete like dismissal of it. And now that I'm in my mid forties, you can't dismiss it. You can just, I mean, I think some people might have the assumption that I will still regret it and they feel sorry for me and that's on them. I think part of, of being in your mid forties is like, okay, so somebody thinks I'll, I'll regret this and they feel sorry for me. I really cannot correct everybody's impression of me and I can't exhort that much energy. While I was in my mid twenties and in my mid thirties, if anybody perceived me as something, somebody who someday will have children, I would annihilate them. It would make me so angry. You would take to the streets, right? Strike out without mercy. Oh yeah. yeah. So I think there is a there's a peacefulness that comes with with the journey that I made. I don't think I would have been as peaceful if if I didn't engage with it so actively, because engaging with it, talking about it, um, being a voice for it, writing about it, giving I give a lot of talks to psychologists about this topic, um, treating it as a form of minority of sorts. Um, I, I talk about it a lot, kind of letting, and, and you know, those talks have changed in the last decade a little bit. It's, it really gave me a lot of peace. I think if there's something that you're passionate about, especially if it's a me issue, like a part of my identity that has been pushed against and, and rejected and you're able to give it a voice it's very healing um it's very hard when you tell somebody something that for you is you know when i first said it back then when i was 18 it was a benign comment and you hear you'll change your mind what's wrong with you are you that selfish women want to have kids you'll never be a real adult motherhood is the most important job you're fucked up, you're psychologically wounded or, or people analyzing my family life. It's because your parents are divorced or really because other divorcee kids don't have kids. Like, whoa, what does that even have to do with anything? It's so condescending and humiliating sometimes. And again, for many, many other people I have talked to, it sipped in. They really felt that something was wrong with them. So it, it again, I never thought that something was wrong with me, but I, I also, the other side is when you fight to change the world and you fight and you fight and you fight, um, you sometimes get really discouraged because it doesn't, just because you engage in a battle doesn't mean the world is changed. And you're so tired, so exhausted by explaining and talking and convincing and showing another side and being patient with other people and where they're at. And I, I have... I have now in my work, I'm much more engaged with anti-racism work and I see a similar thing of like, it's such a Sisyphean effort sometimes, but now that I'm 44 and I'm looking back, it is different. Nobody in my life is saying this to me. And there is a little bit more acceptance. There are a lot of like articles about it in, in popular media. Um, part of the, of the issue is, when, when you're a minority, there might not be any positive representation of you. So like 
there's this movie Beethoven about the dog and there's a child free couple there and they're like, they're villains. They're awful. Um, so I think now it's a little bit more benign. There's some people who don't want to have kids. Like I, I think, um, thinking about how I met your mother, like the Robin, I think is her name. The, the, the news anchor. I think she doesn't want to have kids and she's portrayed as somebody who's, kind of fun and, and awesome. Um, but I might be remembering it wrong. I've watched that show once upon a zillion years ago. There's just a little bit more possibilities and, and that makes me feel a little hopeful. You know, in, in the moment where you're in the middle of, of a battle, it could feel so exhausting. But when you look back, you might see a little bit of purpose. And I think that's, that was, that's rewarding for me. Right, that your work, your advocacy moved the needle forward. Right. And like you said, there's more representation across media and there's more conversation around that. You know, this is something that, you know, for my position as a man, I haven't had to consider at all. So I'm just sitting here listening, being like, that does sound like a immense amount of pressure and an immense amount of, like you said, kind of, you know, identity annihilation or self annihilation or being put into a box. And it's just, yeah, it is staggering, I guess, to hear that and to understand that. Um, and to be privy to, you know, conversations that because of where I'm at, I, I can avoid, you know, uh, when you yeah. talk about these stories and these conversations that you hear, you know, I think most men aren't really present for a lot of those. Or if we are, we're the ones giving judgment, right? We're the ones with opinions about whatever, you know, the child situation um, yeah. rather than receiving that. So it is a very unique experience, a very interesting experience. Yeah, I think I think when you come with something that people don't know, they their shield can be being an expert. And so when they say, oh, you'll change your mind, they don't have to consider other options. They're like, I know something about a deed that she doesn't know about herself. That's it. I don't have to think about this any further. And giving that, that position up is painful. It means that you might have things to learn about yourself that you haven't really noticed. Um, that's a hard one. Yeah. I, we, before this uh, podcast, we are talking about haters. And I would like to talk about that in our next segment, more around this idea of just what you said, right? Of, of people, of like the free choices that individuals make, whether it be along this dimension or on sexuality or gender or, or anything really, right? Lifestyle. It does trigger something in people where they just want to destroy it. Because what I've seen is that it reminds them of their own fear, you know, or their own, you know, failures in some ways or their own limitations, and if you can make it, it means that they could too, and they hate that, right? They're very envious of yeah. that. So for those of you listening, we're going to go into that topic. We're also going to talk directly to you. If you've ever been in a position like a D, if, you're, if you are child-free, you're considering being child-free, um, she'll be talking to you directly. If you want to contact a D, uh, you can go ahead and email uh, the podcast at podcast at mark com. If you want to have her back on a panel or for another episode, everything that you send, I'll forward it directly to her. Um, so let's keep the conversation going. Uh, stay tuned and we'll come back after our break. We're making it easier to listen to the Voice America Talk Radio Network live wherever you go on iPhone, BlackBerry, or Android. Download it from the Apple iTunes App Store, BlackBerry App World, or Android Market. For teens, by teens, and about teens, tune into the uncensored and unedited discussions with young adults on Express Yourself every Sunday at 3 p.m. Pacific Time and 6 p.m. Eastern Time on the Voice America Empowerment Channel. Smart, tenacious teen hosts and reporters from around the country speak up and speak out. Express Yourself. Visit the website for the show to find out more at expressyourselfteenradio.com and check out the show on the Voice America Empowerment Channel every Sunday. In Mark's work with high performers and business owners, it is becoming increasingly clear to him that their biggest obstacle to success is themselves. They are the experts in their field, but are dragged down by their anxiety, poor time management, inability to focus, or self-sabotage. His role is to help you overcome these emotional and organizational issues so that you can truly excel in your business and your personal life. One of the most common hurdles that he sees is perfectionism, a crippling anxiety around performance. It's a fear of not being good enough, being publicly embarrassed, 
or of disappointing others. These fears paralyze brilliant people and bring them to their knees. This course will help you to break free from this mental prison and have more agency in your world. In this online course, we will break down the prison of perfectionism so that you can break out of it. For more information and to sign up, visit mark azaleteachableteachablecom That's Mark, M-A-R-C, dash Azalei, A-Z-O-U-L-A-Y, dot teachable.com. Get the news on our shows and other happenings by following us on Twitter. Find us at VoiceAmericaTRN or Twitter.com forward slash VoiceAmericaTRN. You are listening to From the Ashes with Mark Azalea. To reach the show today, please call 1-888-346-9141. That's 1-888-346-9141. Or send an email to podcast at mark com. Now back to From the Ashes. Welcome back to From the Ashes. I'm your host, Mark Azalea, and we've been talking about choosing to be child-free. If you've been listening to Adi speak and you feel like you're in a similar position or maybe you know somebody who's in that position or maybe you'd want to be more supportive to somebody who has some of these thoughts and, and lifestyle, um, tune in because she's going to be talking directly to you. So Adi, if someone's listening that relates with what you've been saying, what would you want them to hear? What would you like them to know right now? So there's something that just how you're presenting it that I think is really important. You're like the choice. So Yes, having and not having children is a choice. However, it doesn't always feel like a choice. Sometimes it's just something you know about yourself. Um, and, and there is this conflation between just involuntary childlessness, somebody who wants children and doesn't, is for whatever reason, unable to have them or didn't get a chance to have them, and being child-free or voluntary childlessness, there are different names for it. And, and I don't like different people have different feelings about it. I think what I would want them to know is that, and, and that's something that comes up a lot, that sometimes there isn't a why. When somebody says, I want to have kids, it's very rare that somebody will say to them, well, why? Why do you have a one kid? Do you have one to have kids? Like, what's what's the deal with you wanting kids? Um, while people who, who don't want to have children typically are asked why. And when somebody asks you why, maybe they just want to know. But often the question why is a, a beginning of a debate. So like, I want to start a career. Well, there's never a good time to have kids. You should just jump in with it. Okay. All right. Well, there's, I, I would ask people to really hold on with the desire to debate and get curious about this person as a whole individual. I think a better question is, well, do you have a particular reason or is it just how, how you, how you are? Um, or you can ask about their experience. Oh, you, you don't want to have kids. How's that like? They'll tell you if, if they, if they want to talk about the joy, they'll be like, that's great. I feel liberated. I feel like I don't have to worry as much financially. I can like go traveling at a drop of a dime. Or if they want to talk about the microaggressions or aggressions that they are facing, they might say like, you know, and I'm not even making this up, like online and online discussions, people have said, um, I hope someone rapes you and you get pregnant. So you'll have to have a child. Like that's actually like things that we hear. That's wait, not somebody, a progress. Wait, somebody said that? No, nobody said that to me. But in discussions of, of child-free people, yes, that, that is said. And that's actually something that asexual people sometimes get. Like, I hope you get raped so you understand how important sex is. It's, it's really just a disgusting. That's disgusting. That's, disgusting. That, that's unbelievable to say that to somebody. That's Your surprise uh. is, is just, you know, people who are different get, such vicious violence toward them that is completely invalidating their humanity um, and their their choice. Women who want to be sterilized cannot do it. It's just impossible. While a man who wants a vasectomy, that's really easy. So if depending on your your uh, biological sex or or um, um, to a degree your gender you might have a very, very different 
experience. Um, so I think what I would like people to know is that I, I, you know, again, I'm willing to educate. If somebody had asked me a respecting, like in a respectful way, a question, I would be happy to talk. Um, but I, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't necessarily assume that people have the patience and the emotional capacity to keep educating others about their status. Um, so if somebody says that to you and they're not in a place to explain, they like don't want to talk to you about it or they get upset with you for asking questions, don't be defensive. Just assume that like you are probably the hundredth person in their life that just can't get it and go online. There's so much information about it. Um, there are wonderful books that you can read about it. The, the question of why, like, why would you not have kids? You know, it's, it's something that the research have a lot to say about. Um, there's a book called Two is Enough, I believe it's called, by Laura Carroll. There are two uh, child-free writers. One is called Laura Carroll and one is called Laura Scott. So I sometimes don't remember who wrote what. That's focused on those, uh, like, why questions. But there's also an article called Silent Bodies, which I so identify with. It's a, it's a Scandinavian research that showed that women just, just didn't want. Their bodies were silent, a little bit like the opposite of somebody, somebody's body saying, I want a child. The body is like the biological clock is ticking. The womb is speaking. My womb is not speaking. It's, it doesn't say anything to me. It never did. And I... It is really exhausting to try to give a why to something that doesn't have it. Though some people have whys. As I said, this is a community that has a higher percentage of people who are um, really involved in, in social justice. So there is global warming and world's economy and child hunger um, and carbon footprints or or having more like personal values of like, I really want to travel. I, my career is my joy. Um, they're, they're all different reasons why people may want or not want children. Um, there's also a pretty lovely movie that I have enjoyed called To Kid or Not To Kid. Um, it's actually this, uh, this Brooklyn um, documentary filmmaker who decided to document her own journey um, of deciding not to have children. And for her, it was a decision. She was thinking, 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 and eventually decided not to. Um, there's a conference. Um, th there's a, an online community called No Kidding, but there's also a conference, the non-mother conference, I think it's called, or something like, I've never went, you know, but I'm, I'm at the point in my life where it doesn't, I'm not as involved, but there's so much out there, both for people who might feel really isolated and not know anybody else. Like you're not alone. If anybody's listening to me and you don't want to have kids, you are not alone. Nothing is weird about you. You just don't want to have kids and it's fine. But if you hear somebody, that's important. And I want to tell to clinicians in particular, there's a huge difference between asking when are you planning to have kids and are you planning to have kids? That subtlety is really important. Pay attention. I know in my own therapy, my therapist, like, I brought some weird shit to therapy. But the one thing of all the, like, unusual things that I bring, and I have other identity stuff that are a little different, the one thing that he was like, why? Explain this to me. Let's explore this, was I don't want kids. And that was hard to say to him that I don't want to be analyzed about this. This isn't, it, it, just, it just is. Some things are just are the way they are. So I, I would send want your people, dissertation. I I told you I did my dissertation in order to say fuck you to people. Yeah. At, at some point in my life, when people came to me, I would say like, "So I'm writing my dissertation on women who don't want to have children," and you should have seen the change in people's faces. That was part of like my my, my more combative stage with this. Um, so I think I would want people to know that, to know to to. Just treat people who say, I don't want to have kids, just like you would treat somebody who says, I do want to have, I want to have kids. I'm hoping to have a child in the next three years. All right. You'll probably be like, okay, so what's in your way? If somebody says, I don't want to have children, you can say, okay, is there anything in your way of 
not having children. Just be open to it. Um, so, Adi, we have to start to wrap up here. It's yep. been a fantastic interview. I've learned a lot about you, about this community, about this topic. Can you let the listeners out there know where they can find you if they want to continue the conversation? Uh, they can find me at Dr. Adi Avivi on Facebook, um, or they can just talk to you and you let me know. I, I'm seldom on that Facebook page, but I will, I'll take a look now that, that we're out there. Yeah, so if you want to contact Adi, just email the show at podcast at mark Uh You can check us out on iTunes, on Google Podcasts, on everything. Hit us with those five-star reviews. Thank you for joining in. I'd love to hear any feedback as this podcast is getting off the ground. Any kind of support you can give really helps this little fledgling project. So thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll catch you next week on From the Ashes. Thank you for joining host Mark Azale for From the Ashes. Be sure to tune in again live next Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time and 11 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Empowerment Channel. We'll have another edition of the program then. Meet triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters the same. Until next time.